to turn with me tonight to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 22. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomos. Namos is law, Deutero is second. It's the second giving of the law, Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse, 40, verse 22. Scripture says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn into the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Lord, bless this book now. Thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. There's a lot of confusion about the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament when it comes to the doctrine of hell. There's a lot of scholarship out there that says that nowhere in the Old Testament did it ever teach that people went to hell. And one of the reasons they do that is because of the Hebrew word sheol. And I'm going to try to explain that tonight and make a Bible study out of this. I hope it will be something that will help you because uh, personally, I take no joy in this. I take no joy whatsoever in, in a message like this, but it's needful, so needful. We have people today that have no regard for human life whatsoever. Drive-by shootings, they shoot each other to death, and they act like murder today is just, just another, you know, infraction maybe of the law. No concerned at all for the human being that they're shooting dead. And so the reason for that, of course, is because there's no fear of God. There's no fear of God in most of this culture today. No fear. No fear of God. And the Bible said the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So 32 and verse 22 of Deuteronomy, the lowest hell is the Hebrew word sheol. So what is Sheol, preacher? Well, I want you to watch this now. Look at Genesis 37, verse 35. I'm going to show you how it's used. Genesis 37, verse 35. I'll give you a moment to turn there because it's important to follow with me these scriptures tonight. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now notice carefully it says, I will go down into the grave. The word translated grave is translated from the Hebrew word sheol. Sheol, translated grave. Now look at Numbers chapter 16, verse 30. Numbers 6, 16, verse 30. We'll just take the Bible for what it says, folks. Not try to make it say anything, not him haul around. Just take it for what it says. Numbers chapter 16, verse 30. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up, and all that appertain to them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand these men have provoked the Lord. The word translated pit is Sheol. Now we've got a good man going to Sheol, and a bad man going to Sheol. So that puts us in a situation where we've got to understand what we're doing. Okay? So what is Sheol? Well, number one, it's not the grave physically that you dig a hole in. Look at chapter number 35 of the book of Genesis and verse 20. And I'm going to show you a Hebrew word for the grave. We're talking about a mausoleum or a, a, a hole in the ground or whatever. Genesis 35 verse 20. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. And that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. It's still there. It's on the road to Bethlehem. Jewish women go to that grave and they pray for, for children because uh, they saw what a time Rachel had in bearing children. And so they go there. The word translated grave here is kaver. Kaver. And a kaver is not sheol. Kaver is a grave. It's a hole in the ground or a mausoleum, but it's a place where you bury bodies. So when I read in the book of Genesis 37, verse 35, he said, I will go down to the grave. He's saying, I will go down into the land, the unseen state of the dead. I will go down into that side, and we learn this from the New Testament, which is called Abraham's bosom. For at the time that, uh, of course, the time here of Jacob, it was in the heart of the earth, or in the center of the earth, Abraham's bosom. He said, therefore, I'm going to go down to this place. There was no doubt in their mind where they were going and who, it was, and who was there. But on the other hand, 
There was no specific word for a burning hell in the Old Testament. So this is why they use the word Sheol for the Hebrew translation of hell. There was a hell in the Old Testament. It was on the other side of Abraham's bosom. We learn that from the New Testament. We learn it from the Lord Jesus Christ. He taught us these things, so he did through the Apostle Paul. So we've learned now so far that the, word trans the Hebrew word Sheol can be translated as grave, pit, hell. These words are uh, all relative. The grave in the sense of where you put the dead, not where you bury them in the ground, but where they go to. You've got to remember this too. There's a vast difference between where a New Testament saint, a believer in Christ, goes and where the Old Testament saint went. When a New Testament believer in Christ leaves this world, the apostle said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We don't go down to the heart of the earth. That's been taken and moved. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Now, there's a book, look at Matthew chapter number 5 and verse 29. Matthew 5, 29. Now we're coming to the New Testament, and scholarship likes to tell us how that in a certain period of time, people didn't believe what they did as, they, as it progressed and evolved later on. They like to teach that the, the ancient Hebrews' concept of hell was something that evolved over time from his, from his association with Greek culture and from pagan culture instead of from revelation from God. There's all kinds of garbage out there, folks. But here's the best thing in the world. Just believe your Bible. Believe what it says. And, uh, the, you know, it's just like the Jesus Seminar. I don't know if they're still meeting or not. But the Jesus Seminar, they met, I, I think annually, to, to, uh, to expose Jesus to scholarship and see if he ever did really live, if he was a historical character or not. I don't think they're meeting anymore. I don't know what's happened to them. But, uh, yeah, that's a thought there. I hadn't even thought about that. Maybe God uh, pulled the plug and they're gone. Who knows? But uh, they, they, you know, you're, you're trying to go to scholarship. Now, don't you think about this book right here for a minute. This is a holy Bible. Now, think about it for a minute. This book knows you. There's no book on this earth that knows us like this book. And it doesn't spin around about it. It tells you what your problem is. It tells you your problem is sin. Yes. And I want to tell you something. A human agency might have written it on the page, but the Holy Ghost is the one that dictated it. That's what I mean by inspiration. And this is why we have it today. Don't you know that there's a lot of people out there that like to get rid of this book? The first thing that Mao Zedong did when he came into power in China was to get rid of this book. And then he gave them a little book, a little handbook, Mayo's book, they called it. Of course, Mayo's gone on to his reward now, and so they're moving back away from that to something else. This is usually one of the first things they try to get rid of when a dictatorship, you know, an authoritarian dictatorship takes over a country. They want to get rid of the Bible. Now, why? Because the Bible will make you a free man. The Bible gives you light where there is no light. And at least, thank God for the credit of the United States, it still has allowed the Bible, the Bible, to be preached and printed. I don't know how it stands today, but for a long time, the most printed and read and bought book in the world was the Bible. The Bible. Men know when they pick up this book that it's different. It's different. There's something different about it. So... In, uh, in Genesis 35, verse 20, Jacob set up a pillar upon her hole in the ground. Now, in the case of Rachel, she's not buried in a hole in the ground. There's a mausoleum there. There's an above-ground tomb. And I've showed you photographs of it from trips to the Holy Land. Every time I go, I photograph it, and I've been six times, I think. And uh, it's there. But it, the problem is that it's surrounded by Muslim territory. That's the problem with that specific area. The Muslims have taken, uh, have taken control. Now, Matthew 5, 29, it says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee 
that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now, if you've got a concordance, and it can show you the Greek text, it'll show you that the word translated hell here is Gienna. Gienna. And Gienna comes from the word, the Valley of Hinnom, or Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was south of Moriah. And the Valley of Hinnom is where there was a perpetual burning of, uh, of uh, everything, of filth, even dead bodies of the criminals and so forth. The reason for that is because it was during the time of Solomon and others that they had an image of Molech erected there and they would offer human child sacrifice to this godless thing. And they could beat the drums so they didn't hear the little baby scream as they tossed them into the fire to make a sacrifice to their God. Can you imagine people who had prophets and the Bible uh, going to such a depth as that in rejection of the truth to offer up their children as sacrifices? But in any event, over time, the Valley of Hinnom became a place that was cursed as far as these people were concerned. The Lord Jesus Christ used the physical appearance of that to say to them that hell is a place of, of, of suffering and burning and refuge. And he used the term Gienna. Notice how he used it so there'd be no mistake in your mind. Look what he said in chapter number 5, verse 29. Profitable that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Do you think he's talking about something on earth? Well, of course not. He's talking about something where your body goes with you, not the physical body, but your body, your soulish body. You take a man who's, 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 uh, who's lost his legs or his limbs, and I've had read it many times, they can feel their feet when there are no feet. And of course, the reason for that is because you have a body inside that body and that body is what the man, the Lord's talking about in Luke 16. He said, when the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, he said, come and touch my tongue with water. What tongue? The tongue of his body, the Bible said, had been buried, yet he had a soulish body. And that soulish body was in hell. And uh, that's what we find in Luke chapter 16. There's another Greek word translated hell in the New Testament. And that's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 12. But I say to you that it should be more tolerable in the day for Sodom than for that city. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it should be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. The judgment's going to be a just judgment, folks. Just. When I say so-and-so went on to their reward, I mean that. <laughs> I mean literally. I mean that literally. And we have to understand how God sees things. But if it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you and thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall to be thrust down to hell. And the Greek word translated hell is Hades. Hades is generally, essentially, the New Testament counterpart to the Old Testament Sheol. Hades is a Greek word. Therefore, it connects it with Greek culture and the understanding of the Greeks for what Hades meant. The basic meaning is the state, the unseen state of the dead. Hades is essentially the Old Testament Sheol. It has two compartments. It had Abraham's bosom, and then it had the part where the, where the rich man was burning in hell. And that's sad, but that's the fact. Now, you know, right here we ought to stop and we ought to say to ourselves, Lord of mercy, I don't want to go there. Amen. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. You've got to be out of your mind to want to go to hell. You really do. You've got to be out of your mind. In Luke chapter 16, verse 23, now look what he says here. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he showed up 2,000 years ago, cleared up a lot of things, a lot of things about the unseen state of the dead. For example, 2 Timothy 1.10, I want to read this for you. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. Now watch this. 
and hath, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He's making known that which was not known. He's bringing it to light. Now Luke 16, verse 23, and in Hades, hell. Now the new Bibles, a lot of them just put Hades. Okay? They put Hades in here. They don't translate it. And in, in the minds of a lot of people, they are immediately confused. What's Hades? What are you talking about Hades, you see? Uh, what do you mean, Hades? And most people think, well, the good night then, there's, there's no, it's not hell. It's some kind of a mystical place uh, where, where everybody goes to when they die. It, it takes away the sting of the judgment of Almighty God. And this is what we're dealing with tonight. We're dealing with people right out here in Knoxville, Tennessee, walking these streets that will kill you for enough money to get a fix. They'll kill you. They'll kill you. There are people right out there that will grab your little children and you'll never see them again. There are people walking around out there that will kick the door down in your house and come in. And God only knows what all they'll do to you and your wife and your children. And then they'll take everything they've got, you've got in that house and they'll leave with it. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. If you're listening to me right now and you're one of these, you may have escaped the courts. My mind goes back to Bishop up here in the Smoky Mountains about 30, 35 years ago. I hadn't been pastor long. He took his family and murdered them, his wife and his children. He murdered his family. And then he went up here and he buried their bodies in a shallow grave up here in the mountains. And then he fled. That was over 30 years ago and he's still on the run. He had high connections in the government. He was associated with law enforcement. So he knew how it worked. And he's also a very smart man. Bishop has been on the run now as a fugitive for over 30 years. I don't know if he'll ever hear this message or not, but you're going to hell. You may miss the courts. The law may never catch you. You may be able to outsmart every human being on this earth, but the day will come when you take your last breath and you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. And you can't escape hell. So the Bible says in hell he lifted up his eyes. He's in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. See the body? For I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou that thy lifetime receivest good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now watch what the Lord Jesus reveals here in this. And he said, Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Now, folks, this came from the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 16, this is from Christ. Every word that I'm reading to you, the Lord Jesus spoke it while he was here. He says, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Now, this is no fairy tale. This is speaking of a reality. At that time, a reality where the rich man's body was buried, and then the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, and he had a tongue, and he was being tormented. And boy, did he ever want to pray, and did he ever want to preach when he wound up there. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. We're blocked. One, well, nothing has changed, you see, up until that point. That's exactly the way it was in the Old Testament. This is why the word Sheol in the Old Testament can receive a good man and a bad man. The bad man goes to one side of the gulf and the good man goes to the other side of the gulf. That's what happens. But now there's more to it than that. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 8. Ephesians 4, 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, you remember I preached on the ascension of Christ this morning. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. He took them from captivity. 
None of those Old Testament saints went straight to heaven except two that I know of. One's Enoch, he just disappeared, and he was with God. And the other one went out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> Elijah goes up in a chariot of fire, and his mantle falls from him, falls down to the ground. And Elisha goes over and picks up that mantle. And he walks over to the Jordan River and said, Where is the God of Elijah? And he smites that river, and it stops flowing. And he walks across. That's Elisha. So he watched Elijah go up. Elijah told him, he said, if you see me go, if you see me go, I will, God will do what you want him to do. In other words, give a double portion of the spirit. And if you read the book, you'll find out that Elisha uh, had twice the miracles than Elijah did. In other words, a double portion of the spirit. Now, he explained clearly that there's a gulf, and there was a gulf, but then he told them, Paul did, that he led captivity captive. He led them out of there, and he gave gifts to men. He gave the gifts to men when the gift of the Holy Spirit had been given, when Christ was glorified. You remember I preached that this morning. When the Lord Jesus was glorified, then it was time then to send the Holy Spirit in the power of the glory of Christ. So when the Holy Spirit came into this world, and he's here now, he came into this world bearing the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. All that he had been glorified to, and who he is now, is the ministry and message of the Holy Spirit of God. And when you get around somebody, me, myself, I, I love myself, I, me, my, I, 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 and all you hear out of them is that, Holy Ghost didn't wear around that anywhere. Nowhere around it. When he comes, he'll guide the world, not speak of himself, but he'll guide the world into all truth and he'll speak of me. And so he did. Now watch what else he says. Now that he ascended, what is it? But also he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. You say, preacher, do you believe that literally that there was something in the center of the earth like that? I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible, folks. I, I don't know. I may not be a lot of things, but there's one thing I am. I'm a Bible believer. I do. I believe the Bible. I believe it. <clears throat> And so he ascended, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the preaching of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. In plain words, my call to preach came from one who had sent the Holy Ghost down into this world, glorified to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, called into the ministry, Lord, help us. I don't want to exalt me. I want to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why Paul said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To exalt him. Because he can help you. He can help you. In Romans, chapter, uh, in Romans chapter number 14 and verse number 10, the Bible says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that hell has been emptied of the side that was Abraham's bosom. But the other side is still there. Hell is still there. Hell hasn't been brought up. The side of hell where they suffer, is where the rich man went, is still there. And he's still in hell. But we have a judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So what is that? That is for the bride of Christ. That's for the church of God. That's for the believers. And what's he judging you for? He's not judging you to see if you're saved. This is a judgment for your works and your stewardship and your faithfulness to God, your obedience to the Lord. That's what it's about. And he's, the, notice what he says. He says in, chapter, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to hath done, whether it be good or bad. So you've been out here sneaking around, huh? Well, you're saved, you're going to heaven, but I'm telling you right now, your sneaking days are over. <laughs> When that judgment seat of Christ comes up, you're, uh, you know, there may, be, <laughs> there may be some weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
at the judgment seat. Now, it's not for any, it's not going to judge anybody whether they're saved or lost. You wouldn't be there if you weren't saved. But it has to do with your stewardship. The Bible said some men's works do follow them. When it's talking about what you've done on this earth, how you've treated each other, you ought to be good to each other. I mean, we've had death in our church. We've had COVID-19, COVID the plague in our church. We've had all kinds of problems in our church, and we ought to love and help each other and bear each other's burdens. Because when you leave out of here, what do you think you're going to get out there in that crowd? They don't care if you live or die. You should find a sanctuary when you come into the house of God, a place where you care for each other and you bear one another's burdens. If you have an atmosphere, now this is important. If you have an atmosphere like that in here, you give freedom to the Holy Spirit to move in the lives and hearts of people. If you come in here all bound up, carrying uh, vendettas and, you know, and jealousy and anger toward each other and all puffed up with your self-righteousness and your importance, you're going to grieve the Holy Ghost and he's not going to do a thing. He says in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11, I saw a great white throne. Hell never saw the day that it will be as bad as this. Never saw the day when the, when the blazing glory of Almighty God on a great white throne. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Bye. You remember that darkness I talked about this morning, the thick darkness? You remember that? And I told you that's a manifestation of the glory of God, one of the manifestations. Can you imagine in your mind's eye at a time when there was no creation? None. Everything had a beginning. Everything does have a beginning except God. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. He had no beginning. He'll have no end. I, mean, I sit and I look at some of the, the to Hubble telescope and look out into the, look into, the, into the heavens and see all that out there, and I think to myself, good night, I don't even know what's out there. And yet the one I love and I serve made it. Amen. Folks, God's a big God. Amen. Amen, he's big. He's a big God. We're just little tiny specks walking around on this earth. You know, you don't have to get up too far where you can walk outside in the parking lot and they can't see you because you're too little when they get on up the higher they get the smaller you become but the higher they go the bigger he becomes so a great white set them whose face the earth the heaven fled away and has found no place for them and i saw the dead small and great stand before god and the books were opened every last soul of adam's race if they're not born of the spirit of god they're going to show up here. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I don't know of anything more sobering than that. If that can't get a person's attention, I don't know what can. If you believe the Bible and you believe this is true, I don't see how you can go home and go to bed tonight and sleep if you're not right with God. I don't know how you can do it. I really don't. You know, you've heard of the sleep of the innocent. Little children don't have any trouble sleeping, do they? Well, and somebody the other day, I remember when I was talking to my brother, he said, my little niece that was born not too long ago, she's got her days and nights mixed up. She keeps them up at night and sleeps in the daytime. But she sleeps the sleep of an innocent one. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Maybe the reason you have so much insomnia, maybe you need to get on your knees and get right with God. Maybe. That may be the issue. You have no peace in your heart. When you take that, when you lay down at night and you, and, you, and you pull the covers up over you, do you worry about dying that night and where you might show up, what might happen to you? I hope you don't, because if you do, that's a good indication that there's something not right. My grandfather used to come 
when I was just a little boy. He'd tuck me in bed. Then he'd say to me, he said, now I pray this prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And so I'd pray that prayer. And he'd say, good night. I may never prayed anything like that. That's the good stuff. So, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. I hope all of you are saved. I hope you do. I hope you know the Lord. I hope you know that you know the Lord. Because that's important. In Revelation chapter number 22 and verse 10. Seal not the sayings of the prophets of the book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He which is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. For in verse number 15, Revelation 22, verse 15, For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. You leave here like that, that's what you're going to be. You leave here a murderer, you're going to be a murderer. And you're going to get a murderer's treatment. That's what's going to happen. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, he says this. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what the Lord said. I don't want to go into everlasting fire, do you? Now I want to read this tonight, and I'll close with this text. You want to know how to stay out of hell? I would, wouldn't you? Church membership won't do it. Burning candles won't do it. Keeping the Ten Commandments won't do it, although you ought to. None of these things will do it. That's not going to keep you out of hell. 1 John 5, 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Oh, I'll preach your Abba. No, he's talking about believe, trusting from the heart. This is New Testament salvation. The Apostle John now, of course, gives us this. Now, let me say something tonight that I think is so very, very important. We have folks who, 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 who are evangelistic, and they use the book of Romans, and they call it the Romans Road to lead somebody to the Lord. That's fine. That's fine. But you can also go the Galatians Road. You can go the First Corinthians Road. The fact of the matter is, any place in that Bible that you turn, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. They will eventually lead you to Christ, and Christ will take you to God. So if you approach the Bible with an honest heart, and you want to know the Lord, then you don't have to worry about whether you crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and read all the right verses. No, 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 not at all. All you need to know in your heart is that you were genuine, you wanted salvation, you wanted forgiveness, and you wanted the Lord. And he won't turn you away. But we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. What's that mean? That means I love the Lord, I want to keep his commandments. I don't see a thing wrong with the Ten Commandments, except I just can't keep them. But I try to. And I respect them and honor them and love them. The Ten Commandments is a manifestation of the holiness and righteousness of God. Don't ever put the Ten Commandments down. It's a wonderful thing. But then when you're honest with yourself, you'll say, Yep, yeah, but you know, I haven't been able to keep every one of them. And this is why the commandments needed more, because the commandments could only deal with the flesh. The weakness of the flesh is what caused it to fail. Go on, 1 John 5, 12. In verse 10, he said, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. That's pretty clear. What do you mean hath him? I believe in him. He dwells in me. I love him. That's what my life is about, for me to live as Christ, you see. You may not remember the exact date or place or whatever where you got saved. I can understand how somebody can forget the date, but I do not forget the place. <laughs> I know I can take you to the house and take you to the very spot 
where I raised my head and God had saved me. But look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. This is John talking. John says, if you've got the Son, you've got life. John doesn't say you're saved because you prayed a prayer. Nowhere in there. He didn't say that. He said, if you love his commandments, you love the Father, you love the Son, you love the commandments. You keep the commandments. That's what he's talking about. You and I both know that no man's ever been able to keep the commandments. But you try anyway because you love him. And you, this, is his, this, is the re, this is the manifestation of his holiness and his righteousness. I want to serve God. I want to do the right thing before the Lord. I want my life to count right. I don't, at my age, I probably don't have a whole lot of time left. And I want to live out what time I've got left on this earth for the Lord. And be faithful to him. And, uh, and that's what I intend to do by the grace of God. And he knows I love him. Glory to God, and he knows I believe. I'm a believer, and he knows I believe his book. I believe that book. <laughs> I do, man. I believe the Bible. And I know, he said, if by this you shall know that you have eternal life. All right. Now, I believe this, and some folks don't, but I believe this. If you've been given eternal life, you're going to have eternal life. How long? Eternally. I ain't going to leave you. Nobody can take it away from you. If he's given you eternal life, you are eternally saved and eternal life. Father, bless your word now. Thank you for this little time. Maybe I've helped some people with a few things from the Bible. Glorify your righteous holy name. We lift up the Son of God tonight. He's everything. He's everything, Lord. He's everything. And without him, we're absolutely nothing. And we can't do anything without him. We're just stumbling around in the dark play in religion, but with Christ we are everything. And I pray tonight that he be a blessing to all those who heard this now. In Jesus' sweet, holy, righteous name, I pray. Amen.